And then next thing, you, you, you <laughs> sign Aaron Gwynn, like one of the... Well, I mean, yeah, it's... Horn. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Recharge Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Rob. I'm Troyden. I'm Adam. And I'm Will. This week we have uh, another special guest in, and it's Troyden from Crestline Bikes, who are uh, a newish bike company. We'll come on and cover that in, in some detail. But it's a bike that I've had as my personal bike, and I'm actually on two versions of it now. And I might embarrass you a little bit now, because I, I think it is one of my, if not my, favourite bike that I've ridden in quite a long time and i'm not just saying that because you you're here these guys will <laughs> well, will back me up on that but we appreciate that oh, and that, I, i've seen the video of somebody trying to pull that out of you before so it's <laughs> nice to have you just say it <laughs> yeah it's, it's an incredible bike and i've Thank got loads you, of things that i want to cover with you um today and super interesting to have somebody that is the founder and has created a brand and has all these complexities with bringing product to market selling stuff in quite a challenging time that the industry has gone through over the past few years. And, and not only that, almost exclusively e-bikes. Which yeah. Is a, which is always yeah. a big, big plus. It is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have the downhill bike, but that was very much just um, almost like a heritage of the brand thing because that's where we come from. And that's, you know, we love gravity riding. So. so tell us a little bit about how Crestline Bikes came about. And and I mentioned it in the video before, but I remember speaking to you, must have been three or four years ago now, but you would have been decided not deciding on the bike company and to do this many years ago. So how did you go from whatever your job was before to thinking, I'm going to start an e-bike company? So let's think about this. So I was driving home from Park City with my friend Mark. Um, we had been on there on a, out there on a riding trip and we were already starting to embrace e-bikes. Um, we just hadn't found ones that were sort of capable of doing what we wanted to do with them. And I believe on that trip, I think we did like an enduro race or I can't remember what we did or if we were just riding downhill bikes or what we were doing. But on the way back, we were like, hey, like, you know, um, it would be cool if there was this kind of an e-bike out there. You know, I think we would end up riding it a hell of a lot. Um, and then I just said to Mark, I was like, why don't we just try and make our own bike? <laughs> and at the time, I was still working in the music industry, getting a bit tired of, um, I'd been in the music industry probably like 17 years and um, I was just getting to that age where I'm not sure I was really enjoying it anymore. And um, I said to him, hey, like if we, if we want to do this, I'll do it, you know, like I'll put in the time and I'll like... But um, obviously, we needed to raise some money to do it, and um, I couldn't do that on my own. So that's why I spoke to Mark about it. And yeah, we, he was like, yeah, let's give it a go. You know? what, so, what year was this? I feel like this, I'm trying to remember now, but so what are we now, 24? It must have been like, it was like the December of 2020 or 2021. That's not long. Um, yeah. That's yeah. not long. Not long. And... We formed the company in the January and then we started, you know, we actually started working with Cesar from Cesar Roja from uh, Athera Designs. And um, that was, it was actually really good to start with him because it gave us a bunch of confidence, right? It was someone who knew the process start to finish. We knew we'd be able to get there um, and actually get what we needed to, to the factory. And so, and then, you know, working in the different time zones became challenging. Anyway, we, we ran into certain things. And then at, at some point I took on a 3D surfacing guy um, and we kind of just went our own route. And that was when I started talking to Cascade Components about the kinematics. And so I just put those pieces together, you know. Um, and then it was peak COVID. So we got to the point where we had this bike and we actually had validated it. We tested it. We had done all of those things. So that was probably nearing the end of that first year. And then we realized even though before we started developing the bike, you know, through advice of people in the industry, we were like, they, you should order your parts now because everybody's lead times are insane. So we went ahead and probably in that February, we had ordered parts for these bikes, the first batch of bikes. And those lead times just got getting pushed further and further and further out. 
And so we were hoping to have about an 18 month, um, sort of like starting that January and 18 months later, release our first e-bike. Um, but we could see this was, you know, starting to dwindle the, the hopes of that actually happening. And so when we got to the December of that first year, that's when I was, we had developed the e-bike. We were kind of now just waiting, waiting on when we could get parts and actually get in line for mass production and assembly. And I said to Mark, like, why don't we make a downhill bike? Because um, it's something we had we, we had talked about doing that first anyway, like before we did an e-bike. But then we went down the e-bike road. Um, and so I started exploring how to do that in an efficient way. And um, I met uh, in our first sort of six months working with VIP, I met a really good guy who worked for them and was with them for maybe 15, 16 years. And at some point during our six months, he retired and I picked him up as a consultant and he was incredibly valuable when it came to like, hey, like we're thinking about doing a downhill bike. How do you think we should go about doing this? And his advice was like, why don't you, like how many are you going to make? You know, what's the plan? And we were like, well, we kind of just want to make a few of these things. Um, it's, it's like a, we want to get the company started. We want to release something. We want to kind of get the ball rolling. And he said, well, you could consider doing a prototype mold, which is they use a softer material to cut the mold so they can do that a bit quicker. You can't make as many frames with that mold. But the process is quicker because um, the R&D centers were fairly quiet at that point because everybody was just pushing to get more product. So the factories were really busy just trying to actually make product, but no one was developing anything because they were just like, we've got this stuff, we just need more, there's so much demand. So, you know, um, funny enough, his name's also Mark, his name's Mark Tan, and um, he was like, do a prototype mold, we'll get them to wrap them in the R&D center so you don't have to wait to get in line for mass production. Um, and so, yeah, we started that in the December he gave me a contact uh, who used to work at VIP as well. Uh, her name's Ame. She's Malaysian. And she used to run there like, or work in their 3D department and, and validate a lot of the 3D um, drawings that came in from other companies. So she's really well versed in like what all the requirements are, all the tolerances, et cetera, et cetera. And she's really good and quick. So she did our 3D surfacing for our downhill bike. Um, and you know, it was it was a fair bit easier because we had what our e-bike looked like. So we just wanted to make something that had that similar feel. And then it was just update of Geo and then uh, kinematics with Cascade because it was a collaboration thing with Cascade. And the reason why I did that as well was um, we knew we weren't going to make any money off of it, but it was a fun project. And so Cascade came on board. They did all kinematics. They made all the upper and lower links for those first 50 bikes. And that made it possible to do this. But I mean, we went from talking about it in December to being able to sell those frames in like, I want to say like the August or the September of the following year, which is kind of crazy. That's cr I was going to ask how many were, how many bikes were part of the first batch? You said 50. Yeah. And so, so that we made 50, but we also, because well, that, was, that was the RS18, no, that's the downhill bike. Yeah, that's the downhill bike. Oh, wow. So okay. now in the background, we're still trying to figure out getting parts and getting assembly factories and getting all of that sorted out for the e-bike but we released the downhill frame. So you'll see our downhill frame came out before any e-bikes. So that was, what do we now? We're 24. So that must have been like late 22. Um, and they came in in small batches. We only did 50, but they came in and like, I got like 10 and then I got like 15 because they were doing them in the R&D center. Yeah. And so we were just flying them over here. And then I was getting the links from Jimmy at Cascade when he had time to make the links, putting together those and then, so we sold through those 50, probably not like super quickly, um, but probably between that August through to like the January, February of the next year. That's pretty quick. That's like you can't overlook yeah. it. And I've, it was a couple of things, which is like you started a bike company in one of the most difficult times the bike industry yeah. has ever seen with components. Because I remember on an OEM level, it went from a 30 to 60 lead time up to 365 days. Yeah. And that's for OEM new parts just to be able to stock a bike. Yeah. And then then you've said you started on a downer bike. 
which most brands, I don't know if you've heard of um, Airdrop or UK, yeah, UK yeah, brand, yeah. they did a whole project called the Slacker Project on building a downhill bike and the challenges that get faced with building a downhill bike. And yet you've gone, let's build the two kind of hardest yeah, types right. of bikes to, to build in the mountain bike world. Honestly, the downhill bike was like, after doing an e-bike, the downhill bike was was fairly easy because we we used the same um, hardware because we had we had engineered hardware for a downhill bike. Our downhill bike is downhill. I mean, for an e-bike, our e-bike is downhill rated. So yep. you can put a dual crown fork on it and we test it to downhill standards. So all the hardware was good enough for a downhill bike. So we didn't have to go and recreate all of that stuff too. It was like, so if you look at our linkages on the downhill bike and the e-bike, you can swap um, pivot axles and they're all the same, which is nice too because we, you know, you get forced into MOQs as well um, with CNC parts and whatnot when you're making them. So it was kind of efficient to be able to just tack on a couple extra. We, were, we knew we were going to do a run of e-bikes so we just made all those parts and then we used them early for the downhill bike. And then when the e-bikes finally, you know, we got parts, we had those ready. It's funny so. you've done that as kind of a cost saving exercise. But in actual fact, I think something that the bike industry we all can agree on, right, is that there's lacking of standards or kind of cross compatibility. But essentially, you know, with, with Crestline bikes is you can run mixed wheel size you can run full 29 you know there's so much options i mean that's why rob is smiling yeah. and loves the yeah, bikes yeah, yeah. as much as you can do all this adjustment and now you're saying you can kind of do the same between the downhill bike and e-bikes it makes so much sense yeah and we actually learned a bunch from that downhill bike because we made it after the e-bike right and so as we move forward we'll be taking stuff that we learned on the downhill bike into our next e-bike and you know as we progress so yeah i got a question about um the, the suppliers and the factories that you use, like if you've got no experience or history working in, in the industry, how hard was it to get these suppliers and factories, especially you mentioned VIP, maybe you can mention who, who that is, but sure. how, how difficult or easy was it to get them to take you seriously? So I think we got, we definitely got lucky with certain things, right? So I met um, a guy named Larry Pizzi, when I was just riding bikes in LA. And he's actually quite a key guy in the e-bike world. Um, he's very active with people for bikes. He's very active with um, policies and, you know, he's just a really, you know, uh, I, I guess valuable person in that world. And he was super instrumental uh, at introducing me to certain people. And I think when you get a good referral from someone like that in the industry that people trust, uh it's key you know if i just knocked on the door of vip vip as you know is 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 basically responsible for a large portion of bikes that everybody rides um from specialized to yt to uh yeti to forbidden um i mean the list just Careful, goes you're on sharing all the secrets <laughs> now <laughs> <laughs> i mean uh, you know like there's there's a ton of people making bikes at vip and they have a couple different um factories and something that we've actually run into now, just to go off on a bit of a tangent, is uh, the U.S. has imposed uh, new tariffs on things made in China. And I believe, I, I could be wrong with some of these statements, but I believe that your frame is, is kind of the thing that ends up being what drives how you, what drives how you get um, uh, charged your, tar your import duties and whatnot. Yeah. And so what we're seeing now is, so we're, we're in VIP in Vietnam and I think they have one in Myanmar and then they have a couple in China. And, and what I'm seeing is the big companies that use VIP as a vendor, even if they're in the other factories, are starting to push as much work as they can to the ones that are outside of China. And so I've had to now forecast like two years ahead because our factory is like getting to capacity again. Um, so things are starting to kind of roll again, but also because of where we are, they're getting a lot more of the work first. So there's, yeah, there's never ending challenges and things you have to navigate. But yeah. things you don't see as an end customer. You're just yeah. like, where's my bike? Yeah. And yeah. Do, you, do you find that like, I've heard this from a couple of people that design, designing a bike is 
is a challenge in itself. Kinematics, you know, stress points on a frame. It's all it's all quite complicated. That's the fun part, now. Yeah, and, and yeah, like yeah. you kind of said it. It's like the, the the much harder part is logistics, the manufacturing process, actually getting something physically made yeah. and and being you know box ready to sell. Yeah. is the biggest challenge, right? And to go back to what uh, Rob asked about building those relationships or actually getting in the door at those factories. Again, without someone like Larry, um, there it wouldn't have happened. You know, um, I used another consulting company that helped as well, and I forget the name of them. They were down in in San Diego, and they also had a relationship with VIP. and um, And then uh, Larry also put me in touch with our assembly factory, which is called Willing Bikes. And again, like you know, key key things. Those those are probably the two most important things and then to go back to our original bikes like trying to get parts for the e-bikes um you know now you've got to try and get an account with fox or you've got to try and get an account with shram or you've got to try and and at the time those guys were just overwhelmed so you know it was hard for them to take on new customers and so we had to be creative and actually like hats off to shram and Fox and everyone for being creative. So like what Shram did is they were like, look, we can't take you on as an OE out of Taiwan because we can't supply parts to our existing customers. And, you know, we need to look after these guys. We've been with them for years. But what we can do is we can set you up with an, a boutique OE domestic account for the US. So on our first batch of bikes, I actually bought Shram parts in the US and then I shipped them to Taiwan to get assembled onto the bikes. <laughs> because there was no way so so they like it, it's unfortunate that this is the way it worked because obviously there's a lot of waste in this but just just a quick question there so then you're saying assembly was all held in, in, Taiwan. in Taiwan as well and the reason for that is um, complete e-bikes enter into the US with zero duties that is probably going to change but at the time there's a tariff that there was like a concession kind of tariff for um, electric vehicles and so that's why you've probably seen a large majority of U.S. companies always only doing complete bikes when it came to e-bikes. That makes sense. Lots yeah. of people ask for frame only, and they they have a, yeah. a collection of parts that lots of us do, and they want to move from bike to bike. Yeah. So it's interesting to to understand a little bit behind the scenes as to why most brands are just doing complete bikes. It's yeah. funny. It's funny to say that, Rob, because it's. I feel like that's a post-COVID thing. I think there's a. You know, there's been a financial crisis and people are struggling. You know, to to spend that much money on what is essentially a toy. I'm going to uh, piss people off here, but essentially, you know, a mountain bike is a toy. It's just going out and having fun. And I was like, I'd said it when I'd worked for companies. I said, you know, we should consider frame only options because people are more likely to spend you know a small portion or a, you know a quarter half or whatever the cost of a full bike to be able to move their parts over because the parts are still current and things are changing so quickly yeah. at the moment it would be good if it was a quarter or half though the thing is that frame once i mean if you just look at like frame only comp, uh regular bikes those frames are three sometimes four grand i think like a forbidden frame is like 4200 us yeah you, you, you're talking to the wrong person here i've come from direct sales i work for canyon <laughs> <It's about laughs> so, <cheapest> yeah <laughs> so but i guess my point is all of the a, a large portion of the cost of that bike is in that frame and now you add to that frame a whole drive system yeah, so battery, you know? motor, controller, everything and, that comes and, with it. And now you've got to keep in mind that if you bring in just a frame, now you're going to pay duties on all those things as well. Mm. So the frame-only prices are, and I've said this to guys so many times because we've done some small batches of frames and they're like, I'm like, look, you know, we can do it, but these frames are going to be expensive. So and you might as well buy a complete bike, sell the parts, and you'd make the money. You'd make more of the discount than buying it from i think only. there's more value in the complete bikes as long as that tariff stays in place so that is if the, that, that changes is the sole reason that you're because i i've heard in, yeah. in the past they'll maybe don't do frame option just because frame only because someone could spec it so it changes the bike so much that it then they'll go oh this is a terrible bike but that sounds like it's less the case in this situation no i think the guys that are buying our bike i want them to be able to do what they want to do i know what i'm like i know what rob's like you know like if you're really into bikes and you buy one of our bikes, you're going to change certain things. It's impossible for me to build a bike that everybody's going to be happy with. Even if I just built the most expensive bike I could possibly build, there's still going to be some little things that certain people like. 
some people don't like uh, electronic shifting because it, like the the axis stuff moves too slowly, you know, because they they're just used to hammering through gears really quickly. Um, whatever, there's going to be reasons for. But it, it proves the point. You're a rider. You yeah. Know, you, you, you're building a company based around riders' preferences and understanding the market. I'm, I'm, I'm slightly against it. I'm just like, no, no changes. Her bike should be as the <laughs> bike comes out. But I'm very much open to be schooled here. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's like the more flexibility you give a customer, especially with this level bike, I want I want someone to build their dream bike, right? And and put whatever they want on it. So yeah, so we're we're like we're gonna have more frame onlys. Um, we're probably gonna do a signature series, something like that, um, for frame only options. But it, unfortunately, it's like they are a bit more expensive. But what I've seen is guys that want that, they're either gonna go and buy a complete bike, tear a bunch of stuff off, spend the money on other stuff anyway. Then they have the process of trying to sell parts. Um, you know, so it's either they do that or they just spend a bit more on the frame, use some of the parts they already have, you know, and go from there. I've, I've encouraged guys to like, you know, buy the complete bike and then cherry pick because normally they've got a bike, you know, and a lot of these, these parts are cross compatible. So they can like choose the stuff they really want to keep, take the new stuff off, put it on their old bike. They're going to probably sell their old bike. Now they've got an old bike that's got some new parts on it and maybe gives them more value when they sell that. So there's a number of ways to deal with this, you know. The Recharged podcast is sponsored by The Electric Bike Shop, the e-bike specialist. They've been selling e-bikes since 2017 from their first store in Bristol. And since then, they've rapidly grown from that single shop to now 10 stores across the UK with more planned for 2024. The Electric Bike Shop supply a host of major e-bike brands, plus a ton of parts and accessories in stock. The Electric Bike Shop are highly reviewed by real customers, and they've achieved an excellent status on Trustpilot.com with hundreds of reviews. They offer free UK delivery, highly competitive pricing with price matching, they take part in the Cycle to Work scheme, and they carry literally thousands of e-bikes in stock for quick delivery. They also offer test rides where you can get hands-on with the bike so you can try different sizes. There's really nothing like getting on a bike and trying out the size for real to make sure you get the right bike size for you. So check them out at theelectricbikeshop.co.uk where you can see the range, or you can even book a test ride direct from their website at one of their 10 nationwide stores. Thanks again to The Electric Bike Shop for sponsoring the Recharged podcast. I got a couple of questions um, that might might uh, be quite interesting for people that are interested in like drive systems and how, like when you're developing a bike, how are you choosing which drive system to go in it? And, and the reason I ask that is because most components you can change after the fact, right? So if you buy a bike and it's got a fork on it that you don't necessarily love. want or love, you can swap it out. But mm -hmm. you cannot do that with a drive system. So how as a brand are you choosing <laughs> what, whether to go Bosch, Shimano, SRAM, whatever else is out there. There's some new crazy stuff being launched at Eurobike. Like what is the thought process behind that and how well, risky is it? I think it's pretty risky and I think it was easier when we did it than it is now so i think that's something that's going to become more difficult um in one sense so when we made that decision we were riding a bunch of e-bikes right so we just rode you know shimano system we rode yamaha we rode bosch we rode whatever we could get our hands on we rode and we made a decision based off of that riding experience and what we were doing with the bike and what we wanted to be able to do and we chose a system that had the most boxes checked for what we wanted to be able to do with our bike. And you went with Bosch, right? We went with Bosch. Um, now, moving forward, it's it's going to become, in, in one sense, it's going to become more challenging because everybody's progressing. There's new people entering the market. There's more exciting stuff out there. There's gearboxes. There's smaller units that are more powerful. There's there's like a ton of things, right? Um so we basically like would make a list of like what we want to be able to do. Like, can this can this system be set up where we can efficiently remove the battery because we want to be able to have different battery options? Um, you know, say maybe someone wants to travel and be able to grab a battery wherever they've gone or ship the battery ahead. Or um, so we're considering all those things. I know in Europe, some guys can't charge their bikes 
in the garage, they have to take it upstairs. You know, can they pull the battery out, take it, charge it upstairs? Um, so yeah, well, you, you've got to take into account all those things. And there's so many things like support. Um, where can the rider get support? There's new companies coming out now. Um, everyone knows the DJI system came out. Where are customers going to go for support for that system? Are they going to, like in the US, obviously it's a huge brand and they're, um, you know, you can buy their drones in like Best Buy, for example. Like, are people going to go to Best Buy with their bike to get support? <laughs> like, I just don't know. Yeah, like, I mean, the, equivalent, the equivalent for UK is going down to Curry's and you yeah. know, just wheel your bike in. It's not, it's not going to work. It's not gonna, I, yeah. I think that's a, a really valid point. It's a yeah. massive fear. And the thing is, it's an item on the bike which you can't necessarily repair or replace very easily. We talked about this previously in another podcast. You know, your derailleur snaps, your cranks break, your handlebars break, whatever. You know, you just buy a new one. Yeah. You can't just buy a Bosch driver unit off a shelf because there's so much program that goes into it. You yeah, can't yeah. just go off the shelf. So you have to know that you're getting that support. And it, it, it probably is 50% of part of someone's customer journey to be able to buy a bike is knowing that they've got a local bike shop or a brand that is going to keep them covered you also want to make sure it's still the the market leader as well yeah, don't you? yeah. because your bikes are your you have the highest end parts right you have the factory builds you yeah. have the best of the best pretty much and then you've got to almost back, have this foresight with yeah. what, what actually comes out in two years is still going to be the the, the banging choice of motors like you can't get it wrong you well, can't get it it's get it risky wrong. to get it wrong and the other thing is like once that train leaves and you're like okay you you've got some leeway where you're working on geometry you're working on kinematics you're doing the 3d surfacing um yeah i won't mention any names but there was a company we were working with early on and they had chosen um a certain drivetrain and after chatting to us they changed um they were just early enough in the process that they could do that they hadn't really made molds yet. They hadn't spent all that that capital investment. But once you get to the point where you're like, okay, here's our drawings, go make the mold, you're still a long way from that bike coming out. You know, it's it's a, they've got to make the molds and you've got to do testing. Then you're so you're still like at least a year away from having a bike in the market at that point. If something comes out in that year or comes out like a week after you've started the process, or you know, like a month after you started the process. You're kind of stuck, you know, and like, yeah, people. If people, if there's like with an old generation motor on there, but everything else is brand new, but everyone else in the market has got so the Gen Four versus Gen Three, yeah, you're going to be left in the dust. That's a it's a scary, it's scary. Well, to if start you look at yeah. if you look at the bikes that are, um, have come out over the past twelve months, any I get so many questions about which motor to go for, and I'm like, they're all they're all good, but a lot yeah. of people are really worried about buying a Shimano based based bike because it it doesn't maybe have the same performance as as the Bosch. It's now been yeah. updated, so some of the features are on parity, but but I think it does make a big... Uh, people think about it a lot, so it's a big part of their decision. They, they say, I want to buy a Bosch-based bike. They don't say I want to buy a Fox-based yeah. bike yeah. because all that stuff can be changed. But so, then yeah. again, like for, for Will here, like you, you wouldn't choose... You wouldn't go, oh, I'm not going to buy that bike because it doesn't have T-type on it versus an Axis derailleur, are you? Like On a regular pedal bike, is there any spec on there? Maybe a fork or a shock that's brand new that's come out that would... Those are preferences, so, but they're not yeah. going to kill the, no. the sale, really, right? Yeah, there's nothing like that if would, the bike, like, a bike just came out and then a new set of forks came out three weeks later. You're not going. You're not going to go. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want this bike anymore. But if a new motor came out, you're like, I'm stuck. Yeah, yeah. I you're can't like, do I, I want that. Yeah. I can't, like you said you can upgrade it. There's well, no so, option. So, so here's what I kind of think will happen eventually: is everything's getting really good. Bikes are kind of at a point where geometry is not changing a hell of a lot. Um, most people have figured out their suspension. I feel like we're going to get to that point with motors as well. You know, it's going to get to like, it, it feels like it kind of moves slowly for a while and then there'll be like a little jump and like, but I think that you do have that where you, you've got to believe Shimano is working hard to make sure that their next product stands up, you know, and XYZ manufacturers are also just working to make sure they have. So I think that that gap is going to be as we, progress it's probably going to be smaller between everyone unless someone comes a, a, a around with some crazy revolutionary stuff which then 
really can affect you if you've made the wrong decision, right? Well, we've just seen it with the Shimano motor update to be able to be comparable to the brush. Like that, that, all it takes is a motor update in theory. Is yeah. a software update, yeah, right? Software, yeah, yeah, firmware yeah. update. That, that's all it necessarily takes. But I was going to ask you the question of, you know, now that now we're seeing two bolt pattern system, do you think that it's going to be interchangeable motors between brands with the same frame? Or for someone like yourselves, you're doing small batches, would you consider a DJI batch? I don't know. Again, this is just so speculation. The thing, so the thing question. about batches for us is like our batches are more to keep things interesting, be able to change paint, not overstock. Um, you know, we want our bikes to be special, so we don't want to just flood them. We also don't want to be in a position where we're discounting bikes to get rid of them. But once we've made our mold, you know, to, to change that mold between cycles, like, or just to be like, oh, cool, we're going to do a batch of 200 bikes and then we're going to go from Bosch to Shimano or Bosch to DJI or back or what. It's not really as easy as that because... There's we, so much cost in the mold, right? Yeah. yeah. So we have to sell a certain number at least to at least like recoup the cost of the molds and all of that R&D that went into it. And then we can consider doing something else, you know? Um, so it's... once you made as well the, as? Well, I mean, it just... I guess... I guess if you've made a good bike, you could keep running that and then start something new. And if that pattern that you've got on the bike previously, you know, from X manufacturer, say it's it's Bosch for argument's sake, and they update things and they still fit in that bike, we can then just keep building that bike and update those, yeah. you know. If everyone moves to the same bolt pattern, then you can choose different motors per batch. Well, I don't think anyone's going to do that personally. I, I mean, I don't know, but I just don't see it happening because... We can pray. We can hope. <laughs> we, we can hope, but I think that they... And then the other thing too is like, even if they change to a similar pattern, they're all using different size. Um, the motors are different sizes. Like the way they fit together are different. So the shape of them is different. So you're even if you had the same bolt pattern, your frame shape around that, area we probably plate. have yeah, to change so much bash plate and yeah. motor foam that you can put around it to make it look like it fits within a yeah. frame that's not meant to do that so i, I think that's going to be yeah it's going to be a challenge and i don't really see that happening anytime soon so i think if you've got a manufacturer who updates and has a certain bolt pattern for x number of motors big small sl full power whatever and those can be fitted into one shell that would be great right you'd still be tied to that manufacturer um, but you'd maybe have a little bit more flexibility there. Does that mean, am I right in thinking the Bosch SX to the Bosch CX is the same bolt pattern? Well, <laughs> you, this is all embargoed, all yeah, embargoed so information. Anyway, so anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not allowed to talk about this, even though I've seen pictures of it everywhere. It's just like, yeah. no, it was a, we were at Eurobike and they did the worst job at hiding this new Bosch oh, motor. They, they, I mean, what? that shouldn't have been out there though. They well, should have they, just they should have just taken it and put it around the corner once. Was they this realized. the one that had black electrical tape around <laughs> the logo? The thing is, if it didn't have all that black electrical tape trying to hide it, it Let, no one would have noticed. Yeah, would have it's, glanced it's, it's and the Streisland effect, isn't it? I'm surprised yeah. no one came over it because we were quite obviously filming it, weren't we? And yeah. you did a little piece on it, so I'm surprised no one came over from the stand and told us to stop. It was well. So, I mean, they must have not known what they were doing because it's like it's tape. <laughs> It, it or, looked, or actually, they bad. added the tape. Yeah, they added That's black strange, tape. Yeah. It's a strange call. So, it's strange for a company like Bosch, which you know, like we. I, I, it, it was a bike brand. Got, it I, wasn't Bosch. It yeah. was like a separate bike yeah. brand. So there, and there wasn't just one. There was like at least mm. two from different brands who just thought, oh, no one will notice. We'll put black tape around. And it was all no the one. same black tape across the brands. Yeah, maybe Bosch went so around. weird. Interesting. So I got a question about. Um, cost of bikes and financials and like you don't need to divulge too much into this but i saw a post on a popular website a mountain biking website who worked out that you did 50 bikes per batch and they they were like crude calculation 50 times twelve thousand dollars and they're like oh this guy must be a billionaire already because <laughs> he's made six hundred thousand dollars per batch like it's not as easy as that is it well no that wouldn't even pay for the molds wow really? so it's like well the r d process like shipping stuff you had to test it like all of that stuff plus plus molds for three sizes two rear triangles yeah you know we probably had to sell our first hundred bikes to get close to just breaking even you know wow. on those mold costs and then um what you've got to remember too is like when you make a, a bike you're paying per bike so you've got all your mold expenses and all your R&D expenses here in a big pile, right? What's the cost of a mold, if you don't mind sharing? So roughly? It, it, it varies, but it's it's three digits for sure. 
um, and then you've got to do each size. When you say yeah. three digits, you mean like so, like like uh, in the, over a hundred, yeah, hundreds of thousands, thousands, yeah, so six four. digits. Yeah. yeah. I was like, if it's only three digits, I'll, I'll digits get a couple five of zero. <laughs> I'm just focusing on the most important bit. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the zeros are like... <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 they're by default. You know, yeah. They're going to be there. They're, they're going to be there. So, so hundreds of thousands. So, so, so in that range, so like maybe like just a hair under that or just above that, but, but you've, got, you've got to do three sizes. So you've got to do that. Then you've got to do two rear triangles. They obviously cost a fair bit less because they're smaller, right? Um but yeah, it's not cheap to do those molds. Yeah. And that's, I guess, why, you know, like a lot of people make alloy bikes because you don't have that expense. So yeah, but it's, it's like once you've got the mold, as long as you've made something good and you can amortize the, those expenses over your first, call it 100 bikes, you know, for a bigger company. And, and the other thing too is like bigger companies won't only have one mold because you've got to remember that they can only make one bike at a time. Because it's hand laid up. So if you're a big company and you need to like have 500 or 1,000 bikes, you can't have the number of molds we use. You know, they're, they're going to have to like, um, you know, have duplicate molds in order to have the process run quicker. So it's basically like they can double up the, exactly. the quantities by having more than one mold. mold. So but then there's yeah. more people the same in the production. Thing. There's more people physically doing it, all the rest of yeah. it. And, it, you know, it's, uh, I mean, the... I have to say, I mean, I've I've had a look at the Crestline frames inside and out because I've helped Robin take them apart and all the rest of it. And the quality on the frames themselves is really up there, like really, really up there. And I've, you know, I've done carbon inspections and all the rest of it. And I have to yeah. say, it's like that quality as well. You, you're paying for the quality of yeah. the service that comes with it, you know? Well, you get, you get an option to... Um, use different levels and they obviously cost different amounts when so so look mold mold and r&d cost aside now each unit you make you're paying for each unit right um you can use a slightly cheaper version of the carb and that's why you know if you go back to some of the brands like i guess specialized calls their highest end s-works yeah and then Santa Cruz is like CC or C or the, those are just different yeah, levels. Yeah, did of, it as well, didn't they? Like a T. Yeah, yeah, yeah the two. The, and then yeah. The yeah, even even like YT do that ultra modulus frame and high modulus. Yeah, frame. again, it's just it's just a the thickness so, of the so carbon. So he, he has something to spoil everything for everybody, right? All these things are made <laughs> in the same factory. So I just said to them, just use the highest modulus, just make us the best possible frame. So we could come up with some stupid name and be like, Oh, this is our, this level, but we only have one level because that's, you know, the this kind of the bike best we they can make. make. Yeah. Initially yeah. I thought you were going to say so, it's that you're paying for different levels of like the staff, like one guy, one guy really knows <laughs> that how to is, make it. No, honestly, that, that is, is not a bad point you make because, um, that's something I always worry about because you want to have good QC, you want to have good products. And like at the end of the day, you could have someone who comes in and has a bad day and they're mm. following a layup book and the layup book tells them they have the pre-preg all cut and ready to go and they have layers that they have to lay down in a certain order at certain angles and, um, you know, some guy misses one or two layers yeah. or, and you, you have issues. So and you can see, you, and know, you can see cheaper brands that may not have decent or actual afford quality control staff members yeah who, you know i say it for road bike brands maybe some italian ones they don't have a guy in taiwan with doing qc so it's like one in a hundred might be crap yeah like it, it, you never know and that's yeah. that's probably one of the biggest defining factors i don't know what the cost is but having someone there to make sure that and even, even, if you, even if you have someone there i think it's it's going to happen right so then it boils down to how well you support your customer and how quickly you can get them a replacement or whatever you have to do because it's i think it's literally impossible to do this without having that happen at some point yeah. um it happens in the most expensive cars in the yeah, world it's exactly it's, it's, it's manufacturing yeah. And, yeah i've seen every bike brand well you know i've worked in warranty departments and you yeah. go oh, these bikes are terrible but you're only seeing the ones that are cracked and ultimately you've there's got to be compromises in the bike industry with weight to power and quality yeah. ratio and things like that the, 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 and strength it's you, to make bikes as light and as nice they are, that carbon has to be so thin, yeah, you're, so you're, refined. You're, you're, you're playing with an edge, you know. You're, you're, yeah. So it's like, it's like riding on the edge as well, right? You want to push, you get to a point, mm. 
and then I'll crash. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think so. like it 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 puts things into perspective when you are. I mean, your bike bikes are a, it's a premium brand, I would say, and you are at the price of some of the other premium manufacturers, but you are producing very small volumes. And what yeah. I mean by this is you're the same price as probably an S Works bike, but you're making a batch of fifty at a time, whereas Specialized are making way more than 50 so the the economies of scale would say that it's harder to 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 buy stuff cheaper the volumes yeah. that you're you're producing at so i think the way we've um, tackled that is you know we're riders we can appreciate you know uh, the value of bike shops having a local bike shop to go to um so we want to support that as well but we also need to take into account what you've just mentioned where we are not making a thousand bikes we can't go to the companies and be like hey we're doing a thousand bikes you need to drop the price a bit or we're going to go somewhere else or you know we're going to order parts from somebody else etc um so the way we've handled that is you know we have a hybrid model where we are we will sell direct to consumers and we also work with very key key um bike shops that you know we feel represent the brand correctly but we think that's an important uh, aspect but if we have a mixed margin where we allocate X number of bikes to those dealers and X direct to consumer. That helps us balance that and allow us to keep doing this, you know, because like you say, we're doing 100 bikes um, in a batch or say we do, you know, like I think the last, like I took it real uh, cautious this year because everybody's giving bikes away because of the positions they've put them themselves in. So we did 110 bikes. We did 75 completes and 30, um, 35 frames. Um and you know we have to make sure that you know we we're smart about this and how's and it been in terms of we've gone into this era of everyone is ex trying to get a deal on bikes or is almost normalized to be buying bikes at 30 or 40 percent off is that top end of the market still protected who, who is the target customer and, and so is, we've, is been, it we've been pretty fortunate with guys um buying our bikes because I think they're placing slightly different value on different aspects of what they're getting, right? Yeah, they can call you and talk to you as well. Yeah, about we, the bikes, we, which we'll, is cool. Yeah, we'll chat to guys. We'll, I'll try and like you know figure something out. If somebody, you know, I've I've done things in the past where somebody wanted a a frame, but we didn't have a frame, and so I said to them, okay, look, like what parts were you going to swap, or what were you, what didn't you like on the bike? Um, and then I figured out something where I removed a couple of things from a complete bike and sold them that. And then I used that on a test bike or, you know, so I think it's hard to have that kind of a relationship with a customer when you're a really big company. But like you say, I'll hop on the phone with, you know, guys and chat to them. And I think it makes them feel more comfortable that there's someone behind this. Um, they, we're going to look out for them. You know, we, we really believe in our product and we want to stand behind it. So, um, yeah, like. I've sent bikes to New Zealand, Australia, the UK, um, Europe, not big numbers, but there are people out there trusting us and getting the bikes. And yeah, it's, it's been awesome. We're, we're getting really good feedback and it's really rewarding to get those emails where guys are just like, I don't know how you did this. And like, I used to have X bike and now I'm riding yours. And it's crazy because it, you know, it's slightly heavier, but it feels lighter when I'm riding it or, you know, there's just all these different, you know, comments and uh, and feedback which is awesome can i so, just say you now have two of the most influential uk riders riding your bikes yeah rob <laughs> and, <laughs> Is it me? and jasper penton yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <gasps> yes i forgot sorry we need to talk about that yeah that's i forgot about that, that yeah, is, yeah pretty crazy so i've been chatting to jasper a little bit on instagram and super nice kid and um yeah and i was obviously we all have seen him ride which is just ridiculous He's like the mystery. He's like he's, he's like yeah. black magic on the bike. It's insane. And I have a bunch of so the little area where I live in Bellingham. I'm like, I'm probably five minutes from Transition Bikes. They have their outpost. It's like, and we can ride straight into the trails from the house. And there's just a ton of people who ride bikes. And my neighbors, you know, they both ride for Yeti. Um, so and I just watch these kids and like, like. All of them are almost trying to emulate Jasper mm. when they ride, you know. It's <laughs> so, it's, 
Look so, at this guy, has got so much tile. If I could have 1% of that. I know. It's, I know. It's, it's, he pulls, and he, he hadn't pulls been riding for a while, and he's just like, oh, I just need to like... He's, he's, look at he the went, height he's getting He went that. off the radar. He was on Common Style for a very short time, and then went completely off the radar, and there's loads of speculations of what was happening. But he yeah. pulls... He pulls bike into different places out of no speed out of nothing i know it's Ow. insane and that's a, that's a 180 180 mil travel that's bike. a 180 180 bike he wanted a 29 inch rear wheel i was like hey you sure you don't want to do the mixed wheel be easier to throw it around he's like no nah, i want 29 um he's got a 750 battery in there he's got like the full heavy <laughs> weight <laughs> yeah i literally it's just like, want to i could watch this on repeat when i saw this came up the other day i don't really reshare riding posts on instagram yeah. and i reshared it straight away i was like he's back yeah, yeah, yeah. and on crest line <laughs> yeah, yeah it's insane. That's cool. yeah. But just uh just to t talk about the bike for a minute i i think that you you got everything spot on right from the beginning head angle reach uh like travel long travel not crazy long travel but with the ability to take a dual crown fork i've tested your bike in pretty much every yeah, single yeah. configuration <laughs> every time well. i see a bike, rob's bike it's changed in some way <laughs> so like, i love that because I, i'm i'm tall i like a longer rear center of we we've discussed yeah, and then yeah. you you make different linkages with cascade and different rear centers chain stays so now he's making my life difficult because it's like people are going to be like oh well, i want the link rob <laughs> yeah. so we we had so I had a bunch of links from when we were originally testing. Um, and then we settled on this link as, you know, what we felt was best uh, across the board. And I had some other links and I sent you one to, you know, try and your bike with yeah, a longer, longer rear. rear and stuff like that. And it's something that we, I want to do more of um, in the future, definitely. Like, you know, so like the more, yeah, there's, I've got so many ideas of stuff that I want to do. And, and to go back to the systems again and, and them getting closer together, I think once the systems get closer together, um, it's going to go back to like the nuances of the bike. And it's all incremental stuff, right? But it's like, you know, how easy is it to change X, Y, Z? You know, how many different configurations can you set this bike up in that are actually valid Um setups and not just like oh you can do this and this but then no one does it because the one thing doesn't really work very well so it's yeah. like can it's you like, run it 130 on the back and 150 at the front <laughs> yeah do, do you know what i mean but like who would if, ever want to do if, that <laughs> if we were smart and we did certain things there's ways to do those things so that they are functional and work really well like look at look at the canyon bikes at the downhill where they um they have a cnc mount that mounts onto the front the down tube yeah which the, the their shock then mounts to that yeah. so now that gives you flexibility of moving that mounting point around that's part of your kinematics yeah and you can also well yeah it's the position it is and you can also change the position of the shock depending on that linkage as well can't you you could you could use a different stroke length shock i mean sorry eye to eye length shock yeah, yeah. you know um so you could potentially have a bike that's like, okay, you have a 175, 180 travel bike that's a 230 by 65, but then you could potentially move that point and some of the other points and have a bike that could be set up with a 250 by 75, but work correctly for that and not just be like, a, oh, I'm just going to try this and it sort of works okay. But yeah. So those are the kinds of things that I think moving into the future, once all these systems are sort of there and thereabouts where it's like, okay, well so-and-so's got the Bosch and this guy's got the DJI and this guy's got whatever, you know, uh, this, I don't know, like whatever SRAM systems out. And, you know, and, and But I think at the end of the day, it's going to be a combination of all those things um, as long as these systems get to a certain point where it's like there isn't one that's just leaps and bounds ahead of the others. Because yeah. I, I don't know about you guys, but like when it comes to weight too, I've ridden my bike at different weights and sometimes I, I miss the weight, yeah. you know? No, you miss I, the extra weight. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, so I think there's going to be a happy medium as well where it's like, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, 100 kilograms, 6'3", maybe 6'4". So I'm on a different, I'm at a different point when it comes to like uh, weight ratio, but like body weight to bike weight ratio. Mm -hmm. And like there's going to be other guys that want something different, you know, to we be in that same We magic formula, didn't we? <laughs> we yeah. <laughs> Um, well, did a lot of rock long chains. <laughs> doesn't quite work. But I, I th there's a couple of pieces there. I think that having the uh, ability to change the bike shape geometry with things like shock position linkages means that you don't have to produce crazy amounts of carbon frames. You don't exactly. need to produce six different sizes, yeah. six di different chain stay lengths, yeah. which, is, which is amazing. It's been great to be able to 
tinker around and not everyone will want to do that but i like trying to trying sure. to play with things you, you make, just like make the bike as it is they're good to go i'll ride it no matter what and what about travel but there will be a version like that and that's how we'll spec it 100 yeah and, and, and then you can like, go it'll be set and forget if i was yeah, to, yeah. if i was to have a crest line and i would i would set it up 29 29 have it yeah. all set up and once i got it sorted it wouldn't you touch go. it ever again yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. What about travel? Because you went full in with like long travel. Do you see the need for shorter travel? Where, where do you stand on that? So <clears throat> I spent a little bit of time in, in uh, uh, Arizona over the winter. And you get kind of caught up in the riding that you do personally, right? And so it is important to go out and see what other people are doing at different ages and whatnot. And I was quite curious as to why certain manufacturers made certain bikes in certain con configurations and you know the more you kind of see how people are riding them the more you're like yeah well you know maybe that makes sense um so i think there is an argument to having a slightly uh shorter travel bike um slightly more trail oriented geo and maybe that bike ends up with a slightly lighter battery and um you know lighter casing tires etc cetera, etc cetera. um and i think there because people can be scared away by travel numbers um guys are, oh that's too much travel for me i can't ride that bike it's you know it's, but it's, it's like a, that much when you think about it no, I, I know but, but it's, you know it's what a I, psychological thing i, I think, I think it's well, yeah. i think it's psychological but not only that i think people have sat on long travel bikes and certain bikes when they get to a certain length in travel they start feeling very wallowy cumbersome there's not as much support it's harder to move them around all of those things are relevant and they become more relevant when you're not riding that thing aggressively well you could you could ride you can have a you could put a dual crown fork on your on the crestline rs 180 yeah but it doesn't make it a downhill bike because no. if you ride a downhill bike they are sloppy you know when you're pedaling it's intended to well, you know, nowadays there's loads of changes well, and things I, like that. But again, it's it's it, going to be a it's it going to be depends what downhill bike because so we're we're we love more mid stroke support and you'll find like a lot of more aggressive riders want something to push off and so our bike I know guys that would ride could ride like a Levo a 150 travel Levo or a long shock Levo um, with a Cascade Link or something and that bike won't have as much mid stroke support as ours. So it'll feel a little bit more like a couch or more like stuck to the ground than our bike, which has more travel than theirs. But because of the way the kinematics are, and it's not for everyone. Some guys want that feeling. I like, and a, I like a quick ramp up, like, like nice, like you said, yeah. good, like a solid yeah, yeah. mid stroke. Yeah. Again, but again, that's where the difference is between like, you know, your uh, idler pivot downhill bikes, which are meant to just be completely, you know, like chainless feel on the back. Well, that that's also like beginning part of the stroke, right? So yeah. you could, you know, you could have, and that's because of the rearward axle parts, but then there still could be a good amount of mid-stroke support. Like we've been working with Aaron a bit now. Um, he's finally back on the bike and testing, and we've just um, sent him an upper and a lower link because by changing both of those two things, we've managed to get very close to um, a leverage curve that he knows he likes. Right, so we're that. That's almost like a starting point for him, and then he'll we, we can mess with more stuff. That's Aaron Gwynn, just to confirm, right? Yeah, yeah. let's let's just <laughs> let's just discuss this because I remember halfway through the season, and there was a couple of riders that um, had not been announced yet. Yeah, one of which was uh, Greg Minar, and I jokingly messaged you saying, "Oh, have you signed Greg Minar?" Like, sorry, rumor. <laughs> and you were like, "No." And then and then next thing, you you, you sign Aaron Gwynn, like one of the. Well, I mean, yeah, it's like. <laughs> 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 what, what's going Big on dog. how did that all work and, so, and fair play well done <laughs> yeah so, so i mean that was also like i feel like everything about the brand has been organic we haven't done a ton of marketing we haven't like forced things it's been you know we just wanted to happen naturally and we want to do what we believe in and and um the way the aaron thing came about was uh a friend of mine, good friend of mine, uh, Mike Tomlinson, his kid has been, you know, riding with us for the last 10 plus years um, when I was living in California. And um, Gavin started racing downhill and, you know, he's been doing like better and better and he's actually doing really well in qualities and um, he needs to put it together in a final, but he's, he's, he's really like um, come a long way. And uh, he's been training with Todd, um, 
Todd runs Performex, uh, who Aaron and Richie and a bunch of people have trained with for years. And Mike T was on a ride with Todd and um, I don't know why we were on the phone and um, Todd heard that I was on the phone and Aaron didn't have anything going at the time and Todd helps Aaron with the team, um, manages the team. And so he said to Mike, hey, maybe I should chat to Troyden. And then I started chatting, chatting to Todd and then um, – we went back and forth a little bit just to get an idea of what they were looking at doing. And then um, I was like, I just need to speak to Aaron and just, you know, see what what's going on. And so I reached out to Nico, um, chatted to him, and then he gave me Aaron's number and I shot him a text. And then Aaron Nico was like, Mulali from yeah, Frameworks? Yeah. 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 Mm. And, um, and then we just jumped on a call and we just chatted. And, like, we, yeah, we just got on really well. And he he's always wanted to be part of something and – he has a similar outlook to us. It's not like he just wants to like pump out numbers. He wants to make a quality product. And it's not just like we're just trying to just like, you know, make a bunch of money and pump out a bunch of bikes. So, um, yeah, so it was really nice to have those, um, those uh, you know, similarities in how we were, you know, looking at this. And, yeah, it was just a nice opportunity. So, um we just chatted back and forth for for a while and came up with a way to to ha- get Aaron involved. That's I mean, so cool. So yeah. it's crazy because it's not just a sponsored rider; like he's involved, or what? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are the bounds? Because as far as I'm aware, he's he's more involved with the company than than just a just a rider for the yeah, team. Yeah, no. Right? So he's not just a rider. He's got a small ownership in the company, and um, we've set almost like some targets. And over the next X number of years, as long as we hit those targets, Aaron will get like you know issued more equity in the brand crazy so, yeah, i mean yeah. it's cool because so cool. he's committed that's commit that's like yeah, yeah. You, can, so, you can go 50 50 on the brand you know it's like it's it is if it does well then he does well yeah that's, exactly that's the incentive i mean that's it's that's crazy because it's not yeah. it's not so transactional it feels like a lot of sponsorships it's just transactional what's a pro's favorite bike to ride well the one they're paid to ride yeah it feels like the case exactly. but he has a know. vested interest now. and he's yeah. actually the, a co-owner the other really nice thing is um I don't know if people know where the name Crestline comes from, but it's an area in Southern California right on the backside of Big Bear, and there's two really good downhill trails there. And a lot of the Southern California guys and California guys ride there and shuttle there, and and the downhill guys practice there a lot. So Pinkerton, um, I'm thinking like Dooley. um, There's a bunch bunch of kids that have spent a ton of time riding there, and we used to ride there a bunch as well. And so he's already got a connection to that zone and that name. And like, so it just felt like it made sense, you know. And he's on the e-bike now, but that, that downhill bike looks special, doesn't it? It looks yeah, it's pretty sick. incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Dream, dreamy, dreamy. All right. Now, now finally, um, just your thoughts around, we, we touched on it briefly, but the future, the future of e-bikes, because you've, you've had this particular e-bike out for a couple of seasons now. Yeah. I think we're at like it. Or it feels like longer than it is. But if you think about it, we only really started selling our e-bike in March of twenty-three. Wow! What? So just just a year and a bit, basically. Yeah. Crazy. That's, yeah. That, yeah. Because Rob said the future of e-bikes in general, but I'm also like you know we we mentioned about motors and interchangeability yeah, and yeah. the rest of it, and you know you were saying about brands. It's much. It feels like a lot of the drivers. To purchases through the motor not necessarily through the geometry well, that where does that lead crestline you know where where are the frame changes and regardless of the motor or what what can you do so that's where we got to be smart right there's so much there i still feel like there's a lot of opportunity and there's you know everyone's interested in belt drive and um, gearboxes and but it doesn't mean that it has to be a gearbox motor because there's guys working on hubs with internal gearing and you know there's there's things that I think are going to happen that we're not expecting. Um, just like, you know, other people coming into the industry, dropping like, uh, you know, a new system. Uh, there's going to be a lot of that kind of stuff. So I think being able to utilize what comes and, you know, think about ways of actually using these things to the best of your ability, you know, and giving also people the option for different things. So I'd love to see a bike that, you could run with a regular drivetrain or you could have an intern, uh, internal geared rear hub and you could run with a belt drive and you can, you know, 
change your rear wheel size and maybe even adjust your geo a little bit while changing your rear wheel size and then also have like different travel options like we spoke about with like um, different mounting points for your shock so that those travel options work correctly and I think there's like all of that stuff is stuff that I would love to see in the future. You know? So almost it's like you, you rather than buying a frame only option, you buy a front triangle only option and then you choose everything else you want around it with different cascade linkages and rear triangles for the wheel size well, and the I, travel you want. Well, I think if we do, so we learned a lot from our um, downhill bike. So if we do another bike, we'll definitely use similar dropouts on the on the next version of the e-bike and that allows us to only have one rear triangle mold, but gives us the ability of changing even more um, oh, as nice. far as, uh, you know, change stain length, rear wheel size, BB height, which then affects your head angle. Like there's so many different things you can change by moving where your axle is on the rear triangle. And if you have removable dropouts, you can put that in a host of different places you know i'd like to try that i've been trying it with a four six five chain stay or something like that yeah, <laughs> yeah. like people think it's crazy but it really works i'll, I'll try like a 480 or i mean something. The, you know you the cra to... the crazy thing too is like um so i use this website called uh geometry you can get stuff cnc so imagine you're in a world where somebody just needs a they just need a 3d file of something that they specifically want. So say they want to say Rob wants to try a 480 chain stay for whatever reason. And I just I said him, okay, cool. Like, Don't diss it until you tried it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah, here's a here, here's a, a three D drawing. And I charge him a little bit for that and he can go on a website and just be like, cool, I just want one of these. Oh, you it's know? like there's like a there used to be a, there's a website called Shapeways where you can get yeah, things 3D printed. Yeah. You just send it. You well, th it. this would be like a CNC part, but, but the equipment. But where just, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's and it's cool. like okay, cool. So he's got that. So I don't have to go and mass produce that. And but he's got something he wants to try. That's like, like really, I think that's, that would that's be really awesome. modern thinking in yeah, terms yeah. of like it, I think there's a lot more. I don't know. We're going to see more CNC stuff popping up. There's a lot. There seems yeah. to be a lot with like five dev using new CNC and manufacturing process, and it seems to be with aluminium kind of coming back a bit more into the fore light, uh, foreground it seems like that's going to be more common so yeah that's fascinating I yeah think that's, that's that's such a cool i think that'll be cool ability to just be like yeah yeah go get this cut your local cnc yeah I yeah so, so so it's like oh, obviously it's going to take us a little bit of time to like update the drawing or but it's not going to take that much time so you know the amount we would need to charge for that is not going to be that much and then someone can just go and get um unfortunately with cnc obviously if you make one part it's a lot more expensive than making a hundred parts but um, it does, if somebody really wants to try something, it gives that us that opportunity. Totally. You know? Power you, back to the people. Yeah. Well, if you look at the price of the bike, if you're, if you're able to invest in a part that might be a few hundred dollars to try. Yeah, yeah. If you're really serious about this as your kind of yeah, yeah. hobby or whatever, I think a lot of people would want to try that. And Jimmy makes quite a few different pieces now, doesn't he? Not linkages, but I see he's doing some bits with the Bosch battery, little clips and things. Oh. He's, yes, I saw that. Do I you, actually had it. No, I actually have that, and I think it's in my other bag. Oh, no worries. <laughs> so I need to get that to you before I leave, though, for sure, yeah, yeah. somehow, yeah. or leave it. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll mail it or something. But um, so Jimmy's got a, a clip that he made for the Bosch battery, which is a really nice clip, and it's like an over center clip, so you can adjust the tension with which it clamps the battery into the bike. Um, we made some changes initially just to make sure that we weren't um, that the battery is getting clamped nice and tight. Um, but this thing really? is even better. Yeah, as as your bikes age and as like the the rail wears and stretches out a little bit, you can literally just snug it up by um, adjusting the tension on that. And the thing that we like about it too is it's not only um, putting more tension on the battery pushing into the plug point at the end of the rail, it's also adding a ton pulling down onto the rail which helps to stop the battery from twisting as you ride um why so can yeah. bosch do that <laughs> i mean that they could i think there's so many different ways that people are mounting batteries in the bikes um so for them i, I just you know i just don't know that it, it's economical for them to do it but it's nice that there are people out there that can do this kind of thing and and are doing it um you know like the clips that that Bosch makes is like a molded plastic piece with some metal in it and you know what they might be like 15 20 bucks um that thing's going to be like 100 bucks you know because it's just so much more work to to make it and the argument is Bosch 
Bosch are known for their battery and motor technology, not for their not for their hardware technology necessarily. Yeah. And I think so. that's such it's such a cool little thing with a paracord on there. It's just like it's a really complete little clip that you put on there. And I know it's and, awesome. It works really well. I to really need issue. to. I mustn't forget to give you that. And then I've got an XX1 cage for you as well. Oh. Nice. An access cage. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. do you, do, have you seen my drawer of doom with those transmission cages? <laughs> yeah. I've bent. I've probably bent more than anyone else in the world. <laughs> yeah, I can't yeah. believe from the first episode of the podcast till the last one, my dream spec has changed. I've sacked off electronic gears because of the yeah. stuff I've seen with you and and the issues. If if something goes out, then you, you've got no feel on that shift. So yeah, it's it's fascinating though. There's the all these aftermarket parts are being made, and it's it's just improving everything. And you kind of. You're at the forefront of that. Well, I sure. think I'd rather have Bosch focusing on the motors and like certain other things. Um, as long as we've got guys doing this kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. I mean, so. the, the, I've, I've known of previous generation Bosch batteries on a certain brand's frames popping out because of the distance between those yeah. clips and, not being right. And, and, and the thing too is it's like there's so <laughs> many different ways things are mounted. Um, we were very... Uh, we we deliberately deliberately chose a method that Bosch had approved and was all Bosch parts because we didn't want to be in a position where we try to do something different and then we had issues and we wanted people to get support so we wanted to make sure that we just used parts that they provide and I think what has happened too with a lot of that stuff is like um, it's happened to a number of different brands where they've come up with some way to mount the battery and then it hasn't really worked that well and. You Bosch just kind of say, well, it's your, it's not, it's not our. Kind of muddies the waters a little bit. Part. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> not my problems. Yeah. 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 No, but again, you, you fit something wrong. On, you fit something aftermarket and the battery doesn't work or something pops out. Bosch the, can't go, well, exactly. we can't fix that. Yeah. It's, mm, it's their thing. And, and that's another thing about all the new systems available and who creates them and what they do and how they fit together. And you don't want the ability for people to point fingers. So having a cohesive system, the DJI thing looks great because they've done everything, right? So if something's not working, it's a DJI system. There's other systems out there where they use this part from someone else and as soon as it's like, oh, this battery was created by X and this motor was created by Y and these aren't talking to each other, it's like, oh, but it's the battery. No, no, it's the engine. No, And then you're like, your customer's just waiting and not getting the support they need. Anyway. Sounds cool. cool. Well, Sounds cool. Um, before we wrap up, has anyone, anyone got anything else they would like to ask? Will? Adam, I no? was just going to say that that bike we were looking at with the the green one especially was dreamy. <laughs> <laughs> I love the colorways you've come yeah. up with. Though, is it like difficult choosing a color? Is it? Like, I mean, is it that is, the fun part. It's fun, but it is difficult, and it's like, yeah, you can't please everyone, right? So you just oh, got to. You just got to. How much is that one? It's too much so for you. Could you so. give me a special deal? With <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to ask uh, Mikey for that one. That's, his. <laughs> That's so, so good. Yeah, no, there's. I, I think I might have like a handful of frames that I'll sell later this summer, you know, um, and then we'll keep frames for the team for next year. Nice. Yeah. Well, dude, thanks so much for coming in. And, yeah, thanks and for well having done, me. And congratulations awesome. for creating a bike that competes with the big boys and Thank exceeds you. them in many examples. I, I think I, I did a video when I first got it titled how this small bike brand is beating the competition. And I still stand by that, like the performance of the bike, the quality of it, how it rides, the most important thing. And having somebody like you that you've got so many good pieces of feedback online on the forums and stuff saying Troydon was amazing. Help me sort out this. And it, it's, it's not often you get that from a bike brand. So well done and kudos Thank to you, you man. E even, Thank you, Rob. Even down to uh, going, we're not the best at kinematics. Let's get someone else in who's the best and making it, being humble and accepting yeah, and yeah. making collaborations wow. with people. I think it's great. I think what you've done is incredible. Thank you so much, guys. We appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, dude. Thanks so much for Cheers, coming man. in. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks. 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 I like I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked. I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs>